The Miller procedure is an acronym and it stands for minimally invasive, limited ligation, endovascular assisted revision. Well, every interventionalist who does procedures will come across this problem where a patient presents with a hyperpulsatile access, you go ahead and you treat the outflow stenosis. And by the time the patient's getting off the table, they're already complaining that their hand is numb and cold. So as interventionalists, we have to not only address the outflow, but we also have to have a mechanism for addressing the inflow. Banding is a technique which has been around for over 30 years. I made a modification to the procedure that actually made it much more successful. So the, this is where the arterial anastomosis is. We go as close to the arterial anastomosis without actually being right at the artery. And we look for areas where the axis is nice and superficial. That you notice there's a little bit of a scar here. Sometimes we try to stay away from the scar, but in this case, we're gonna be forced to go kind of like right on top of it. He has two large aneurysms here, which have been developing over time. And despite performing angioplasty across the outflow, he continues to have too much flow on the axis. And that's why we're going to go ahead and slow it down today. The single biggest problem with sizing the site of banding is you have to understand the physiology. Radius to the fourth power. Flow moves in a tube at a factor of radius to the fourth power. So any one millimeter change in diameter will quadruple the flow rates through the tube. So therefore very tiny incremental changes in the end intraluminal diameter will dramatically change the flow rates. And that's where the angioplasty balloon comes in. We use the angioplasty balloon as a sizing dowel. We position the balloon across the area that we want to perform the banding. And when the balloon is fully inflated, we tie our surgical suture down around the sizing dowel. It gives you a perfectly sized intraluminal diameter every time. The beauty of it is that I use a 2-0 proline suture because it has stretch. So if you make a three millimeter band for a patient who has a steel syndrome or a four millimeter band for someone who has a high flow access, you can modify either one simply by taking a one millimeter diameter larger balloon and simply stretching it a little bit. The procedure is actually very handy because if something is wrong and the patient's not able to get adequate dialysis treatments because you slowed it too much, you can either stretch it or you could take a bigger balloon and break the band. So it's actually completely undoable. And that, that's one of the things that makes it beautiful. The minimally invasive procedure that we perform utilizes two small incisions. The remainder of the dissection that occurs is a blunt dissection using a simple Kelly clamp to come underneath the axis, so under the skin and under the axis until we pop through the other side, then under the skin but over the axis so that we grab a stitch and pull it all the way around. That's a very simple blunt dissection. I think it's a medical student level dissection. The only thing you need to be wary of is if there's a lot of scar tissue in the area, it'll make the dissection much more difficult. So every time I start a case, I get two accesses, one toward the inflow so I can perform the banding, and one toward the outflow where I can position my flow catheter. That's very important because I don't like to change the position of the flow catheter. I like to put it in, leave it in its exact place, not move it for the entire duration of the procedure, so that way every single time I want to get another flow measurement, I'm not worried that it's in a slightly different place and it's obscuring my result on the flow meter. So that's a critically important element. We always start with an initial flow rate. I get access in both directions. I get my flow rates. I figure out where I'm going to do my banding. The purpose of getting that initial flow rate, I mean, that's critical so that you know where you're starting. If there are two and a half or three and a half liters per minute, then my usual target is to slow them down by about 50%. So on a high flow fistula, I might use a four millimeter intra intraluminal balloon to slow them down. And ultimately, I'll measure the flow at the end. And if I've only achieved 30% reduction in flow with that, then I might use a 3.5 millimeter balloon or a three millimeter balloon and then stage it that way and check flow measurements in between each and every um, balloon incremental change and until I achieve about 50 to 60% flow reduction. The first thing that we do is we anesthetize the skin with 1% lidocaine containing epinephrine in order to gain access into the fistula. We always gain access in both directions. Here you can see the aneurysm. We are evaluating where we're going to place the band. I always pinch the skin to make sure that the skin and the fistula body are two distinct tissue planes and not matted together. This is a percutaneous procedure. We gain access toward the venous outflow and place a six French sheath. The transonics catheter requires a six French sheath.
the procedures are performed using um, conscious sedation, a little bit of Versed and fentanyl is utilized. A full angiogram is performed in order to ensure there are no outflow stenoses. If there are any outflow stenoses, they'll first be repaired using balloon angioplasty techniques. We'll gain access toward the arterial limb of the fistula and ultimately place a five French sheath. If the procedure seems more complicated, I may place a seven French sheath in order to have better control over the system in case I need to uh, place something like a covered stent. The five French sheath is fully inserted. A diagnostic Berenstein catheter is then passed across the uh, inflow and into the feeding brachial artery. We use fluoroscopy in order to ensure all of our procedures are done uh, correctly and have proper imaging. You can see our catheter is gaining access into the brachial artery and then we'll do a full artery uh, arteriogram with extremity angiography all the way down to the palmar arch. You can see the patient has a large dilated hypertrophied uh, artery. In this case, the patient actually has a high origin radial artery which is connected to the fistula. In this image, flow is coming down the artery and you don't see any flow bypassing the access indicating the patient has a relative steel syndrome. In the next image, I'm compressing the fistula and you can actually see the brachial artery adjacent to the radial artery, which then goes down and perfuses the forearm and hand. First, we will obtain a flow measurement. We use a 10 cc syringe filled with saline and perform a forceful injection. And we always repeat the procedure a second time just to ensure accuracy of the first measurement. A second forceful injection is performed. And you can see the patient is flowing at about 2,500 cc's per minute. So our goal will be to decrease the flow by approximately 50%. We first start by making an incision in the juxtanastomotic segment of the fistula. It's about a half centimeter in length. The Kelly clamp is then used. You can see the tip is relatively dull. And the first thing we do is we build a pocket. Then we will tunnel underneath using just standard blunt dissection techniques. Once the Kelly clamp has made its way to the other side of the fistula body, we'll palpate where the tip is poking through the skin and make a second incision in that location. Again, we build a second pocket. Once we have the second pocket, we'll then tunnel all the way underneath. You can see in the diagram here, we tunnel underneath the fistula, make the second incision, and then pop through with the Kelly clamp. This is seen in real life in this image. We'll grab a 2O proline suture and pull that underneath the access. The diagram shows the suture being pulled underneath the access. We'll then make our dissection across the top of the access, grab the suture and pull it through. Here you can see the Kelly clamp coming across the top of the access, grabbing the other end of the suture and pulling it through. This gives you a subcutaneous loop of proline suture around the body of the access. Uh, we pull through a doubled loop of proline, so that then we have two sutures. This way, if the first suture doesn't achieve our goal of adequate flow reduction or it's too tight, we can then remove it and use the second suture without having to re-perform the dissection. Fluoroscopy is used to measure the uh, dissection plane so we can mark exactly where the balloon needs to be positioned. The balloon is inflated as a sizing dowel and then we then tie the sutures down around the inflated balloon. First we want to feel that there's no flow getting around the first uh, ligature which is tied. Then we tie a total of six knots around the balloon and you could see how the balloon would be completely occlusive in that image. Then we deflate the balloon and pull it back and then check for flow across the band. The most important thing is to feel a pressure gradient across the band. You can actually see the arterial anastomosis beating stronger than the remainder of the fistula. That's because we've now created a pressure gradient across the banding area. We'll then repeat the flow measurements. 
And once again, we'll do two flow measurements in order to get the correct number. You can see we've reduced the flow by approximately 45%. And once that's done and we're happy with it, and there's good flow in the excess, we've performed another arteriogram. You could see where the band has created a very nice ligature around the fistula, and it's a precisely measured ligature of exactly four millimeters in diameter in this case. Essentially, we're done at this point. We remove our wires. We'll suture the sites where the sheets were placed. We'll then suture the site where the banding was done, and essentially the procedure is done. Okay. Nice and soft. At the end of the procedure, the patient simply walks out of the room. They didn't require any special instrumentation, no special catheters. The procedure is minimally invasive. It doesn't get any simpler than this.